Good evening in this sunset in Saudi Arabia. Now, any discussion about any country needs to begin by putting it in context. In the ancient history days, the Arabian Peninsula was made up of a number of Polyethius tribes around the desert, not playing any significant role in the geopolitics of the time because you could get from Persia to Egypt without going through the desert. And then came the birth of Muhammad and the creation of Islam. The second most important prophet in Islam is Jesus Christ. And the teachings come from John the Baptist, they come from the Ten Commandments, and they come from the God of Abraham, the God commented Judaism, Islam and Christianity. And if you doubt that, the Kaaba, the black box in the middle of Mecca, around which the Muslims circulate during the Hajj, is built on the foundation of Abraham's first temple. Muhammad believed the rabbis and the priests had strayed so far away from the teachings of Abraham and the teachings of Jesus Christ that they had become corrupt. What Muhammad preached wasn't a different religion from Judaism or Christianity. It was an evolution of both Judaism and Christianity. And one of the most important things on the Saudi Peninsula then became Mecca and Medina. Mecca particularly because every Muslim has to at least once in their life do a pilgrimage to Mecca. Go forward to the year 1703, the birth of Muhammad al-Wahhab. He believed that the Imams had abused the religion, taken over the power and corrupted it for their own influence. Not only that, the worship of idols and saints similar to the Christian church offended Wahhab because he believed that Islam is a monotheist religion and the worshipping of idols and saints didn't match with his outlook. When he preached his version of Wahhabism, his home village kicked him out and he came here. The village of Alderia, and Alderia is the ancestral home of the Saud family. Wahhab and Saud together created the Wahhabist view of Islam that we have today, and the Wahhabism and the Saud family are integrally linked. Those in the West who think Islam needs a reformation forgets that Wahhabism actually is Islam's reformation. Behind me is the Al-Mazmak Fort in central Riyadh. In 1902, King Abdulaziz attacked this fort with about 40 of his men forcing their way inside and killing the representative of the Ottoman Empire, proclaiming the beginning of the third Saudi state. Really, it's not very big, and you can imagine in 1902, it's surrounded by other mud brick buildings and sand. After 1902, King Abdulaziz then sought to unify each of the nomadic tribes and the Saudi Peninsula. But that was a challenge to the Ottoman Turks that still ruled here. Then came the First World War. In the aftermath of World War I, the British were a little bit worried about Al Saud extending his influence outside of the Arabian Peninsula. So what they did is they created Transjordan, Iraq here. And then in 1938, they discovered oil. And Saudi Arabia went from a nomadic society living in dust huts to the modern vibrant economy we see today. The thing about Riyadh is it's full of a lot of contradictions and juxtapositions. Like walking down here, this could be an old street made of mud brick buildings in any Middle Eastern country, but this is Riyadh. It's a city with tall skyscrapers, gleaming glass buildings, and enormous wealth that you see built on the side of the petrochemical industry. Yet just here in old Riyadh, you get the hints of the buildings that were here and the main part of the city until a generation ago. It's not that long since Saudi Arabia has moved from a dusty, irrelevant sidekick to global politics to what is now one of the most influential cities in the world. In all seriousness though, the change that we're seeing symbolized by these last of the mud brick buildings being destroyed and replaced with modern gleaming skyscrapers and a modern city is very symbolic of the change that Saudi Arabia itself is going through. As the last of these buildings go, so do the last of the influences of the more strict Wahhabist version of Islam. Women now being allowed to drive. Men and women are now allowed to go to cafes together. These are the symbols of a society facing fundamental change. Indeed, King Abdulaziz, from when he was living with the Bedouins until when he died in 1953, saw incredible change from Bedouin living to a modern economy. We are going 
scuba diving in this boat. But think about this when you think about change. Abdulaziz could remember being on a camel in the desert, living with the Bedouins. And by 1953, he was a king of one of the most influential countries in the world. His son, King Salman, is king today. And King Salman can remember sitting on the knee of Abdulaziz, hearing stories about riding around on horses in the desert. They know very well, this royal family, that it only took them one generation to come from desert-dwelling nomads to a powerful country, which is why for Saudi Arabia it is so important to reform their economy. Reform is real and it's happening. It's faster than some people would like, it's not as fast as other people would like, but it's changing. And it's changing based on the underlying reality of economics. If they don't reform their culture, they can't reform their economy. And if they don't reform their economy and oil becomes worthless, just like they went from Bedouins to oil rich, they'll go from oil rich to Bedouins. And that is driving the change in Saudi Arabia. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. Saudi Arabia is very quickly getting up to the top of my, I really enjoy it, really like it. This, this coffee is good enough to be in Melbourne. The people here are extremely friendly. You need to come and visit Saudi Arabia. It is a mind-blowingly good place to come.